Major funding for the series, Louisiana, A History, was provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the State of Louisiana. Corporate funding was provided by Bank One, proud to celebrate Louisiana's diverse past and committed to investing in our state's future. Community Coffee, part of Louisiana's rich history. Since 1919, devoted to providing signature coffees to our communities. Additional funding was provided by the following history patrons, helping all citizens discover the extraordinary legacy of Louisiana and its people. In the early 20th century, elemental forces worked to sweep great changes through Louisiana. We started sinking up dirt and building up this levee. We knew we couldn't hold the water back. Probably the most clear item in my mind was the roar of the water. The Mississippi River loosed itself upon the lands it had created and left behind a disaster of historic proportions. In the decades that followed, a great wave of populist upheaval washed over the state, carrying away much of the old political establishment. When World War II began, Louisianians went off to fight, and the fight came to Louisiana. Once the war began, this was the scene of battle. It was German submarines who came over in January and February, and then right off the Louisiana coast began sinking oil tankers. After the war, rhythm and blues and rock and roll changed the face of popular music. And Louisiana remained as colorful a place as ever. Yet it was the question of color that began to divide Louisianians. I'm the best friend the colored man. Erlong was trying to do something. I figured he was not crazy or nothing, but he did a crazy thing according to the white people at that time, standing for black folk. In what would be at times a rough ride, Louisiana rolled forward through the middle of the 20th century on the currents of extraordinary change. The first part of the 20th century was a time of revolutionary changes in Louisiana. Gathering Force was a populist uprising, led by one of the most charismatic and controversial leaders in American history, Huey Long. But not all of our leaders were politicians. From World War II to the first stirrings of the Civil Rights Movement, Louisiana has been home to many important but often overlooked heroes. One night, in the middle of the night, the church bell started ringing. People fired their shotguns. Everybody was awake, and they knew that there was something wrong in the community, and they needed help. So my father and my brother and I went out there, and we started sinking up dirt and filling up this and building up this levee. We knew we couldn't hold the water back. Probably the most clear item in my mind was the roar of the water when my mother and dad got all the children up to start dressing. And my mother started putting clothes in pillowcases in case we did have to evacuate. But with the roar of the water coming on, they pretty well knew. The Coast Guard was evacuating people with a boat named Shark River. We flagged it down and it stopped. And it had a, had a capacity of 18, but we were number 23 and 24 on the boat. 
and it had very little left above water. But it took us to the high ground at Mansura. And as we went down the bayou, there were a lot of people on the levees waving and trying to get the boat to stop. But of course, it was at, full, at capacity, over capacity, really. And uh, they couldn't stop. The flood of 1927 was the greatest natural disaster the country had ever suffered, leaving nearly a million Americans homeless. Of those, the largest portion lived in Louisiana, approximately 200,000 people. Storm after storm dumped record levels of precipitation on the central United States, swelling the Mississippi River and all its tributaries until finally the levees began to burst. You could draw a line from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, due south to the Gulf of Mexico, and all of that area as far as the river, and in many cases on the east bank of the river as well, was underwater. At its widest, the river covered over 100 miles in width, so it was a true inland sea. It ended up that you could get in a boat and go to Vicksburg, or you could go to Monroe, or anywhere you wanted to go east of them by boat. Thousands scrambled in vain to shore up the crumbling levees including hundreds of prisoners and black Louisianians who were forced to work in deadly conditions along the river. The part of the state hit hardest was the French-speaking region of Acadiana. Downriver in New Orleans, nearly 15 inches of rain fell on Good Friday of that year. The greater the flood, ironically, the safer New Orleans was going to be. And the reason was that in a truly great flood, there was no possibility that the levees far upriver from New Orleans were going to hold the water in. And when those levees broke, the water was going to flow out of the river. It would inundate Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, and much of Louisiana, but the water would never get to New Orleans. To the wealthy elite who controlled the city, the real danger was not floodwaters, but fear. New Orleans was the economic capital of the South and an important center of international banking. But the banks were emptying fast as Northern investors scrambled to move their money out of Louisiana and up to higher ground. As this rain is falling, pouring out of the sky, the leading bankers of the city are meeting, and they decide that they are going to use all their power, political and otherwise, to dynamite the levee downriver. It would take 80,000 pounds of dynamite to open a crevasse in the levee at Carnarvon, 13 miles downriver from Canal Street. The Mississippi washed through at a rate 20% greater than Niagara Falls. The farmers, fishermen, and fur trappers living in rural St. Bernard and Plaquemines parishes were evacuated, but their homes and businesses were utterly wiped out. Most received no real compensation. The devastation following the flood was staggering, but it could have been even worse. In the first federally assisted disaster relief, the American Red Cross constructed massive refugee camps saving many Louisianians from certain starvation. The Red Cross set up tents for each of the families, and they had mess tents where uh, people went to eat. Nowadays, I'm sure there would be plenty of complaints about conditions, but they were just happy to be somewhere and have some food and shelter. The Great Flood of 1927 brought changes to Louisiana that would last long after the waters receded, for many people in the isolated region of Acadiana, the Red Cross refugee workers were their first contact with modern America. In one encounter, the wife of a relief official who had opened his home to a refugee family asked the mother to turn the lights off before she went to sleep. The next morning she got up and found that the lights were still on. And so Mrs. Stephen asked the woman, why didn't you turn off the lights like I asked? 
And the woman responded, well, I blew and blew and blew, but I never could get the light to go out. It was the first time she'd seen a light bulb. Along with the torrent of American technology and culture, tremendous political changes were on the rise in Louisiana as well. Ruined by the flood, many farmers, sharecroppers, and small town merchants looked to state leaders for help, but nobody bothered to reach out to them, except for one fiery young politician from Wynn Parish. A few months after the flood, Huey Long is running for governor. His campaign is against, quote, the plutocrats, the self-appointed rulers of the state, unquote. Everybody knows who he means. He's talking about the New Orleans bankers, really, and the big oil companies. And naturally, he's elected. Huey Pierce Long had run for governor once before and failed. But more and more, ordinary people in Louisiana were losing patience with the so-called government by gentlemen. Huey Long seized upon the people's discontent and ignited it with scorching oratory. The of the people not only give up their property year after year, but they go further and further and further into economic slavery. And yet so no aristocrat ever ruled Louisiana with such absolute power as Huey Long would. My mother used to say, now when we had the lights turned off because we couldn't pay the utility bills, I'm gonna call Senator Long about this. Now she never could, you understand, and never did, but she still had within her breast the feeling that there was somebody who cared and that if she called Mr. Long, Mr. Long would make things right. As I traveled to, around Louisiana, particularly out in the rural areas, I would go in many homes and there'd be a picture of the Lord, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, uh, on the mantle, and there'd be a, another picture of Huey Long. And uh, many people idolized Huey Long. And it was a question of, uh, he was a hero. Huey Long was born on August 30th, 1893. He often talked of his poor upbringing among the red clay hills near Winfield, claiming that, like Abraham Lincoln, he had been born and raised in a log cabin. In fact, his family was one of the largest landholders in Wynn Parish. But unlike the wealthy elite he would topple from power, Huey didn't owe his success to any particular privilege or economic advantage. He had a magnetic personality, he had a superior intelligence. Huey Long was the kind of man with a photographic memory. He never forgot anybody he ever met or any fact he ever knew. And Huey Long was also the kind of individual that people instinctively would move out of the way to let him by. He wouldn't move out of your way. Although Huey Long was a voracious reader, he was too impatient for a conventional education. Expelled from high school, he eventually enrolled in Tulane University's law program. Huey had studied only a year when he arranged for a special bar exam just for himself. They gave it, he passed, and Bussey became a lawyer without ever having obtained a high school diploma, a college diploma, or a law school diploma. Huey Long had much loftier ambitions than just the practice of law, however. When he first married Rose McConnell, he told her that one day I'm going to be president of the United States. Being just 24 years old, though, the only statewide office he was eligible for was a seat on the Railroad Commission, which regulated public utilities at the time. It may have been an unremarkable job, but Huey Long used it to do remarkable things, and quickly he gained notoriety. The people of Louisiana would know that Huey Long was championing their causes by attacking the big corporations that were gouging the people with high gas and oil prices. Having worked for a while as a successful traveling salesman, Huey pitched just as convincingly to his constituents as he had to his customers. My father used to tell me about Huey coming to the Rapids Drug Company to sell merchandise and uh, patent medicines to my dad. And dad, that's the first time I heard anyone use the phrase that he's a heck of a salesman because he, he could sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo. 
When he ran for governor in 1927, Huey sold the people of Louisiana promises of better roads and bridges, hospitals, schools, and especially free textbooks for children. I grew up in a very poor family. Uh, when I was in grammar school, my father told us we couldn't go to school the next year because he couldn't afford the school books. That was the year that Huey Long put in free school books in, in the public education system. And consequently, I give Huey Long a great deal of credit for whatever I became in life. When Long took office as governor at the age of 34, there were fewer than 300 miles of paved roads in the entire state. When his term ended, he had stretched them to nearly 1,600 miles. Those smooth, straight roads became emblematic of Huey's new Louisiana, now on the move and no longer spinning its wheels in the muck of the past. To the populous governor, going forward meant rolling over the rich and powerful. Humiliated by the upstart governor, Louisiana's powerful ruling class struck back quickly and hard. My grandfather was Walter Burke, and he was a president of the Louisiana Senate during Huey's impeachment trial. Huey did some pretty unconscionable things. He'd send the state police to a newspaper, just bust it up, and break the presses up, you know, if he didn't like something that was in the paper. It's fair to say he was a dictator. But the night before his impeachment trial, the state police, I guess, went to the homes of a number of the witnesses, and they were threatened. They didn't do it to my grandfather, but he was one of the few who would testify. The proceedings turned rather ugly. The governor's younger brother, Earl, reportedly bit one of Huey's critics. But in the end, Long survived the political assaults and emerged more powerful than ever. Every man a king. Huey Long may have promised every man a king, but it was clear enough who wore the crown. Fine. Soon, Huey would become a familiar voice to listeners around the country. We didn't have television in those days, and, and radio was very prominent. Huey Long would come on radio and he'd say, now this is Huey Long, and I'm going to play some music, and I want you to get on the telephone and call your friends and tell them that I'm on. And I'm going to give you about 10 or 15 minutes to do that. And you'd be amazed at the number of people, my dad included, that would immediately get up and get on the telephone and start calling his friends and other people would call their friends to tell them to get on the, uh, the, turn on the radio and listen to Huey Long. Huey Long was poised to spread his message well beyond the borders of Louisiana and appeal to Americans everywhere. The message was now, share our wealth. We expect to see the 48 states of America and the United States fall in line with Louisiana Share Our Wealth program. That will mean that there'll be no such thing as a man without a home and something to eat and something to wear and a job. If you allow a big man to have billions, then all of us can't have anything else. So we propose that none shall be bigger than a 10 millionaire, and none shall own less than a home and the comforts necessary for a home and property to educate their children. The entire federal government would run on the basis of these confiscations from millionaires. There wasn't nearly enough money in the country to do that. Huey Long was playing a shell game. Whether he believed it or not, if he did believe it, he was awfully naive. If he didn't believe it, uh, he was a charlatan. Huey quickly lost patience with President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. His call for change was capturing the attention of voters around the country and worrying the White House. Either one of them, and it was got to have a candidate away from the Republican Party and away from the Democratic Party, I, for one, am perfectly willing to see that there is another choice in the United States in 1936. I personally believe that uh, Huey ushered in a lot of these reforms, not only for Louisiana, but for the, uh, for the nation. We're talking about minimum wage. We're talking about the 40-hour uh, week. But he pressured Roosevelt to do those things. Back home in Louisiana, he continued to crush anyone who opposed him. One of the enemies punished by Long was Judge Benjamin Pave of St. Landry Parish, 
His son-in-law was Dr. Carl Weiss. On a muggy night in September 1935, Weiss came to the state capitol and confronted the senator. Exactly what happened next remains in doubt even to this day. In those days, you got the news by an extra, and I remember hearing this boy holler, extra, 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 here Long's been shot. According to the conventional theories, Dr. Carl Weiss shot Long. The senator's bodyguards then drew their weapons and gunned down his attacker, riddling Weiss's body with more than 50 bullet holes. But there's also good reason to doubt that version of events. Much of the evidence in the assassination, such as the bullets, have disappeared. Huey Long's clothing that he wore has disappeared. There's a great deal of controversy and question as to whether Dr. Weiss did it all by himself or whether there was a conspiracy and whether the bodyguards struck Huey Long. But while Huey's death came as a shock to the nation, it was hardly a surprise. Anytime you'd be discussing politics, invariably somebody would say, somebody needs to wipe him out, somebody needs to get rid of him, he's just, he's just a dictator, you just, somebody's got to do something. But really, I heard that more than once. In a great measure, Huey Long shot Huey Long because Huey Long, with his vindictiveness, he engendered a climate of hostility that caused this state to be a, an armed camp. For all those who may have hated Huey Long, however, there were a great many more among the poor and dispossessed who regarded him as a hero. Never in its history has the South seen such crowds. More than 80,000 filed solemnly past his bier, many visibly affected. When you understand that he was elected to the United States Senate in 1930, he took his seat in 1932, he uh, was killed in 1935. He had three years, essentially, in the, uh, in the national arena. And during that three years, he became one of the most photographed, one of the most discussed people in the country. While the Great Depression had stupefied much of the United States, the effects in Louisiana seemed much less severe, if only because the state had been so poor to begin with. Because of the fierce rivalry between Huey Long and President Roosevelt, relief from New Deal programs was slow to come to Louisiana. When Huey Long was assassinated, and then the next year, Dick Lesh elected governor of Louisiana. Lesh had no quarrel with the New Deal, and therefore he made his peace with Franklin Roosevelt, and Roosevelt pumped millions of dollars of federal money into Louisiana. For example, he used PWA money to build a new charity hospital in New Orleans. Therefore, the state benefited a great deal from the New Deal programs under Lesh. However, it wasn't his buildings and bridges that earned Governor Lesh headlines around the country. In 1939, journalists began investigating deep-rooted corruption in the governor's office and throughout the remnants of the long political machine. What they uncovered was startling. The scandals of 1939 were of such a, such a magnitude that it would be difficult to even imagine anything like that happening right now. The net result was when the governor went to prison the uh, president of the state's flagship university went to prison. The head of the Louisiana State Medical Society went to prison. People killed themselves, they committed suicide. It's important to remember, though, that this, is, uh, this was not Huey's doing. This was his uh, legacy to these people who didn't know how to handle it. Following the disgrace and humiliation of those scandals, Voters experimented briefly with political reform. They ushered into the governor's mansion men like Sam Jones, who worked to clean up much of the corruption. In 1944, country music and movie star Jimmy Davis led the anti-long ticket. As governor, Davis may not have done much to improve Louisiana's lagging economy, but at least he made people feel better. 
okay. He sang You Are My Sunshine. He was popular. He was pleasant to everybody. He was polite. People liked him. <laughs> when skies are gray. What finally spurred Louisiana's economy was the advent of World War II. The state became a crucial location for the United States military as the nation readied for battle. Zero hour in Louisiana, the greatest field exercise in American military history with over 40,000 motorized vehicles and half a million men. Louisiana was the site of many training camps and of the 1940 Louisiana maneuvers, which were the biggest maneuvers ever held by the United States Army. 2,000 officer referees keep score as the Army puts the accent on tank warfare and anti-tank defense. George Patton was a part of those maneuvers. Dwight Eisenhower made his reputation in the Louisiana maneuvers. There were 400,000 people involved in the maneuver. There were just an awful lot of soldiers in Louisiana, primarily uh, in the central Louisiana. It ended the depression for central Louisiana. Well, the city of Pineville uh, went from 26,000 in 1940 to, to 58,000 in, in 1950. During the maneuvers in 1940 and 1941, mock battles were carried out over some 30,000 square miles of Louisiana soil. Before the end of the war, more than a million servicemen would receive their training at Fort Polk near Leesville. Louisiana made its contribution and then some to the Second World War, both in food, of course, and cotton. And it was a place where German POWs captured in North Africa were sent and put to work, mainly in the cane fields, which the Germans hated. Once the war began, Louisiana and her coastline actually became the scene of battle. It was German submarines who came over in January and February, got across the Atlantic and got down into the Gulf of Mexico, and then right off the Louisiana coast began sinking oil tankers on their way up to the factories in the Northeast. So these submarines could come up at night, look through the periscope, and there would be a ship silhouetted against the sky by the lights on land. And boom, and they'd let them have it. The Germans called it the Happy Hunting Ground. On shore in New Orleans, thousands of workers were constructing a unique amphibious landing craft for a man named Andrew Higgins. He was designing flat-bottom boats for the oil companies, which were then exploring in the bayous of Louisiana. And he built this boat that later became known as the Higgins boat. A little more than 30 feet long with a flat bottom that could turn around in its own length. And he could put a ramp on it that could drop down so that a whole platoon of men, 30 men, could get off immediately and start firing right away. Every American soldier who went ashore in an invasion in World War II did so in a boat built in New Orleans at Higgins Industries. If Andy Higgins had not designed and then built those landing craft, we never could have gone in over an open beach. The whole strategy of the war would have been different. Adolf Hitler called Andy Higgins the new Noah. Dwight Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe, called him the man who won the war. Louisiana gave the nation inspiring war heroes. Some are well known, such as General Claire Chenault from Tinsaw Parish, whose air squadron was the celebrated Flying Tigers. There were many others, too, not so renowned to history, who helped win the war. Louisiana also contributed more than its fair share of soldiers to the war effort. Men who joined up more volunteered out of Louisiana in proportion to the population than from any other state. When I got to the beach, I found that the traffic control officer, who was a colonel, had become a casualty. And so I then was put in the position as a 23-year-old Army captain of being the traffic control officer for Omaha Beach. Less than a year after the Allies landed on the beaches of Normandy, the war in Europe was won. Victory over Japan would soon follow.
No one forgets VJ Day. In New Orleans, the strippers came out of the bar on Bourbon Street. They came into the traffic on Canal and took all their clothes off. The whole country went crazy. <laughs> When the war ended and soldiers returned, they found that Louisiana was becoming a very different place than the one they had left. All along the Mississippi River, between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, petrochemical plants were constructed or expanded. Oil production in the state jumped from 100 million barrels per year in 1940 to double that amount by the end of the decade and the Standard Oil Refinery in Baton Rouge came to employ 10,000 workers. Electricity came to homes in Louisiana during the 1940s, many homes that had never had it before. Louisiana was urbanized, cities like Monroe, Shreveport, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Alexandria grew rapidly, and there were many, many changes. Families were now seeing more of their sons and daughters going to college than ever before. Huey Long's devotion to Louisiana State University had boosted the school's stature and attracted nationally renowned intellectuals. The university was home to the seminal literary movements represented in the Southern Review and to writers like Cleoth Brooks and Robert Penn Warren. They were vigorous, creative minds, eager to get on with the study of literature, get on with the new way to approach literature. Warren's Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, All the King's Men, was inspired by his observation of Huey Long. He was writing that book during World War II, and he often said himself he had as much Mussolini in mind as he did Huey Long, that it was the question of the way that power was, was grasped uh, how it was exerted, how, how it came to affect people for the good and the bad. So he's looking at uh, a political issue about leadership in immediately after, the book comes out immediately after World War II, at a time when the whole issue of what kind of leadership, what kind of government can the free world maintain. Penn Warren is just one of the greatest writers who ever lived, and he did it all. He wrote essays, criticism, plays. He was an educator, a member of the fugitive movement. He was a great novelist, a Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, he was a magnificent poet. There was nothing he did not achieve. Outside of LSU, the vibrant literary climate of Louisiana continued to foster native talent and to lure flourishing new writers. It was during this period that playwright Tennessee Williams settled in the French Quarter and peopled the American stage with slow, smoldering characters like Blanche Dubois and Stella Kowalski. Well, he was just a marvelous writer, and certainly for actors and for women. He understood women, I think, more so than, than most playwrights. He knew how to bring it out lovely sense of poetry in all of his writing, I must say. So rich for uh, the exploration of the characters. It was rich, and I miss him a great deal. In the 1940s, we see a sort of high mark for Louisiana presence in the national consciousness. Tennessee Williams' Streetcar Named Desire premiered. Lillian Hellman's All the Little Foxes and then Another Part of the Forest, Toys in the Attic, all these Louisiana plays on Broadway. It was an extraordinary time for Louisiana and New Orleans to be in the national imagination. Louisiana was even starting to sound different. Just as this had been the cradle of jazz a generation earlier, Louisiana continued to be a place of tremendous musical innovation. Beauty Ledbetter, better known as Lead Belly, popularized songs like Goodnight Irene, Midnight Special, and Pickin' Cotton. Although he grew up in Shreveport, he was more often associated with another part of Louisiana. Angola. 
Lead Belly is a mythic figure in American culture broadly, and not just Louisiana culture. Uh, and uh, his, it, it comes from the fact that he touched a number of different kinds of audiences. Then he had the situation that he was imprisoned a couple of different times for murder and found himself in a couple of different times singing his way out of prison, or at least getting the attention of the warden. In New Orleans, rhythm and blues and rock and roll were fast replacing jazz as the city's favorite music. Found my thrill. That's Domino, uh, Lloyd Price, Smiley Lewis, and you know, then you begin to get more of a pop sound with people like Alan Toussaint coming in and adding to it. In North Louisiana, of course, Jerry Lee Lewis, just like Fats is the Buddha-like, smiling, genteel, creole gentleman of New Orleans with sweetness in all directions. You know, Jerry Lee's the sort of snarling, hellfire killer man of the North. I changed my mind, this love is fine. For goodness gracious, great balls of fire. Great Kiss me, balls baby. of fire. Uh, <laughs> you know, in one expression, that's kind of like the Holy Spirit meets sexuality, you know, all in one line. 